You're listening to Shift Everything, a podcast by West 40, where we challenge the status quo in education. I'm your host, Chris Coffey. This episode of Shift Everything is about how Illinois schools can best support newcomer students, including many children from Venezuela who are arriving in Chicago on buses sent from Texas. Recent reports put the number of Venezuelan refugees in Chicago at about 19,000, with about 11,000 staying in city shelters. That's on top of about 30,000 refugees from Ukraine who arrived in Chicago following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So what's happening to the school-aged children who are arriving, and are our Illinois schools prepared to educate and support them? Well, I'm joined by Dr. Carmen Ayala, who served as Illinois State Superintendent from 2019 until early 2023. Dr. Ayala oversaw the development of the state's equity journey continuum for schools, and she spearheaded efforts to improve diversity through recruiting and retaining teachers of color. I'm also joined by Rebecca Vonderlack Navarro of Latino Policy Forum. That's a nonprofit organization based in Chicago with national ties focused on equity and education for Latinos and English learners. Dr. Ayala and Rebecca, thank you very much for joining us today on Shift Everything. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Dr. Ayala, this is in the news a lot. We're talking about newcomers arriving to Illinois, specifically Most of them are arriving in Chicago. As a education leader who ran the state schools for several years, are we prepared to handle all of these families that are winding up in Illinois, specifically in Chicago? Are schools prepared? What are you hearing? What are you seeing? Thank you, Chris. Uh, Good morning. Hi, Rebecca. Good to see you. Um, You know, Are we prepared? The situation with the recent asylum seekers and refugees is something that is happening all of a sudden, uh, crisis level. So sometimes you're never prepared for a crisis, you know, just like the pandemic, right? But are we prepared from a policy perspective, from the state perspective in terms of what are the things that should be in place with um, children who come in for whom English is not their first language. We've got Ukrainian students, we've got Spanish speaking students from Venezuela and other countries uh, that we have had over the years have come into this country on asylum refugee status um, and undocumented. And we have Article 14C of the school code, which gives you all of the things that need to happen whenever you have students that are coming into your schools that need additional supports, and particularly with regard to language. Now, this particular group of students coming in now also have an additional uh, layer, if you will, and that is the social emotional, the trauma, Uh, Many of the students are coming in uh, having experienced very traumatic experience of walking through Central America, right, and going through some very difficult, difficult times. And so it isn't just the language academic piece that needs to be paid attention to, but it's also that emotional, you know, the Maslow's, (laughs) you know, basic needs uh, that need to be attended to. And so that's probably the biggest distinction that we're seeing today. And if Chris, if I could just piggyback off that, I think I just want to double down on the important point that Dr. Ayala is making about dealing with the trauma first. I think sometimes maybe practitioners might worry, hey, if I don't get going on those academics, they're just going to fall behind and they're already behind. They had interrupted schooling in some cases. But if if academics are forced too soon, you know, an affect, a wall can go up in that kid's brain and and make it almost more difficult. Um, and, and I think, too, that perspective, not only is it dealing with the trauma, but understanding the assets and the resiliency that these students bring to the table and with support and with dealing with that trauma first, dealing with the socio-emotional, trusting in time that the academics then will make sense and be possible for that student. But pushing it too soon can really be problematic. Thank you very much for your insight. And Rebecca, I apologize that I did not refer to you as Dr. Vonderlech Navarro. I'd like to read to you uh, excerpts from a recent ABC7 report from September 28th 
that paints the picture of what you both were just saying, including how the journey from Venezuela up through Central America, ultimately to America, was so entirely difficult. And now they are here uh, in, in the Chicago area. I would just like to read this for a moment and get both of your thoughts. Uh, it does paint a very vivid picture. Again, this is from ABC7 on September 28th. Despite surviving the treacherous eight-country journey from Venezuela to the United States, the family's new struggle is finding work and food to put on the table. But the mom says her girl's education is what keeps her going. Quote, this is our daily routine. Routine is something many people take for granted, but the mother and her family of five represents one step toward long-sought stability. Quote from the mom, I want them to study for them to have a good future. This is the country of opportunity and more for my girls and their education. The mom says America's promise fueled the courage it took her, her husband and her three daughters to leave their home in Venezuela and trek north for months on end. Almost one year after their arrival in Chicago and much of what they still sought still eludes them. That's a stable home and gainful employment. The one exception, the pursuit of an education. The mom says, that was the best thing that happened to me, that they could study. They were so excited and the people at the school have helped us so much. And when asked what she hopes, the mom said, quote, that they become good girls, that they succeed, that they don't have to live what I lived. The girls' school has provided a critical source of nutrition for them. As with all CPS schools, they receive breakfast and lunch at school for free. These are meals they can count on and they enjoy, which isn't always the case at their shelter. Finally, the CPS says it's enrolled 5,700 English learners this year, another 1,200 over the summer, and are in the process of enrolling an estimated 1,000 additional students. So when I read to you this mom's story of the journey and now how school is helping them, is this common? Are we hearing this frequently from a lot of the people who just arrived, or is this an exception? I'll, I'll take a dive, uh, Rebecca. I think it's pretty common. And it's common because of what I mentioned earlier. We have had um, standard policy and procedures in place. We have had, we have standard procedures for undocumented students. These students would fall under the undocumented status. <clears throat> These students would fall under uh, homeless students because they don't have uh, a, a home that they call home a place to go to, um, to lay their heads at, to bed at night. And so there are resources that, that are available. Um, they would qualify for free and reduced lunch um, that secures a meal that they would have at school. The mom talked about education and that is many of the parents dream when they come to this country and they have children it's it's to have a better life so that their children can um, get a better education and that's something that is common to many of the children that come to this country with their families um, and so you you will find that as a common element I think our schools are doing um, a, the best that they could do. They're doing a great job, but they have their challenges when they're receiving the number of students that they're receiving, when there are shortages of the teachers who speak the language of the students. Um, so there are some challenges that are being faced, our schools are facing. We need to continue to try to advocate and support and guide the schools um, during this time. But they're doing an incredible job considering what they're facing in, in some places. Dr. Vondelak Navarro, from a policy perspective, what is the state doing to get more teachers who speak the language into the classrooms? Are you hearing anything regarding that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, one thing that I think was spurred under Dr. Ayala's leadership uh, at the state board is we received COVID money um, and that was used for a variety of things. And we knew that it could be used to address issues around um, the teacher shortage, uh, particularly teachers that come from diverse language backgrounds. And there are a number of teachers that maybe studied education in their home country or have been working as paraprofessionals in schools in the U.S. And they have that home language. They have a desire to work with kids. They have experience with it. But many of them are on 
on what's called a provisional license. And so we were able to work together to get I think it was about $4 million of COVID money to support those teachers on their path to getting licensure and the endorsement, you know, that specialized skill set and working with linguistically and culturally diverse students. And I would also say that um, there was a lot of work in the legislature to increase the uh, scholarship amount for the Minority Teacher Illinois Scholarship. And what's nice about that scholarship, not only does it benefit teachers of color, but there's a specific set aside for Black male candidates and for minority bilingual teachers so that they would kind of be the first to be prioritized for those scholarships. And for those out there that have provisional teachers right now in your school, that Minority Teacher Illinois Scholarship is something that those teachers can access and use. And then lastly, in the last budget, Pritzker concentrated about $45 million uh, to invest in growing teachers in particular areas of the state. It really was honing in on the areas of the state with the most shortage. And um, um, the forum quickly worked to create a, a guidance brief with ISBE on um, how we could target high school graduates who have the state seal of biliteracy, um, career changers who might want to work in education, but thinking about different candidates that could serve uh, this pool. And what's beautiful is um, they're likely going to be working with the uh, Illinois Workforce and Education Re uh, Research Collaborative. It's a institute out of U of I to analyze how this money is being used. And I think it's such a great real-time way of us to get information on how districts are not just recruiting, but also retaining uh, bilingual teachers. Very good point. It is uh, equally important to keep the teachers happy that you already have. Dr. Ayala, what can you tell us about other communities, suburbs, cities outside of Chicago? Um, are they offering to assist CPS saying, hey, we're willing to take students and families and support them? Uh, can that be a challenge? Are you seeing anything along those lines? Well, <clears throat> what we're noticing or what I've uh, noticed as families uh, begin to, to settle somewhat, uh, many of them are beginning to move outside into the suburbia metropolitan area of Chicago. Uh, my sister is a teacher and she came back home the other day and was telling me about some children that they have arrived uh, very recently in the school from Venezuela. And this is a suburb about 45 miles southwest of Chicago. And so the suburban areas are receiving the students and have been receiving the students. And they are, again, doing what they need to do to help um, acclimate the students, um, to get them going, um, to provide resources for the family, to tap into the community resources. You know, we, had, we, we just talked about the teacher shortage. That's a long-term solution, right? The, the resources that have been put in place, the 45 million from Governor Pritzker and, and all the things that are put in place to help with recruitment and some of the things for retention. Um, but we have to really take a look at what are those strategies that are immediate right now? How can we help support these families and the students? Um, one of the strategies that I have talked about in other opportunities that I've had to speak on the topic is tapping into the community resources that you have. You may have some parents who could be a liaison between that asylum family, new family, and the school. People that would be able to translate, to provide language support. Uh, to help uh, the families with, you know, where do I go to get support here? Or how can I find out about, you know, information about this? And I think that in the Latino culture, as in many cultures, we call it the comadres. <laughs> this just intense, intricate sense of let's help each other. Um, and I think tapping into that is going to be very critical in many communities uh, are doing that. West Chicago, I know, is doing that. Plainfield is doing that. Elgin is doing that and really helping to support families. Um, they've been doing it for a very long time because these are communities that have received uh, recent arrivals into the country and into their schools. And so many of these communities know uh, what needs to be done and are reaching out 
And I think that how, for example, um, in the West 40 area, we can partner with different districts and, and support each other and give each other ideas, I think is a wonderful thing to do. And if I could compliment what Dr. Ayala was saying, I think uh, she just brought up some wonderful ideas of how we can bring that home language uh, into the classroom, right? Yeah. In rich and exciting ways. It's just so important. Um, uh, but also <clears throat> this opportunity, and Dr. Ayala did this in North Berwyn, and I think there's other districts of, of providing professional development to the teachers that are there. There's a specific sheltered instruction observational protocol, um, which is kind of on your way to understanding certain strategies and knowledge and skills around building English as a second language, um, and even using Title II dollars to support staff that you have that may not be bilingual, but to get the ESL endorsement. Um, I know I talked to uh, Dr. Barb Marler, who was in Skokie. She recently retired, and they even had teachers of elective classes um, that were supported to get uh, the ESL endorsement. And they said, you know what, I'm teaching band in a way I never thought I would teach band. But it just had this beautiful way of bringing alive the content in rich and exciting ways. Um, that obviously helped those newcomer students, but also just improved teaching overall. So I think you want, it's a both and, you want to think about rich ways to bring in that home language with parent liaisons, paraprofessionals, career changers, whoever you might have. But it's also with the staff that are there building their knowledge and capacity to support the home language and build English as a second language. Rebecca, I I mean, you hit on some very critical key points um, and how we can support the families and look at it from a systemic approach. You know, schools have resources. You have, you mentioned Title II, there's Title III, there's Title I, there's different uh, resources. And the students generate the resources and should have access to all of those resources. Sometimes we create silos and we restrict who can have access to certain resources. And I think more and more as we really look up about on equity and access and how we can create opportunities for all students, um, how those resources are used to help support recent arrivals, such as the Venezuelan and the Ukrainian students, I think is something that school districts should analyze and take a look at. Well, Dr. Ayala and Dr. Von der Leyen Navarro, I'd like to, to kind of wrap this conversation up with talking about measuring success. Once the children are in school, how do we know if what we're doing is working and having an impact on them? Wow, it's something that Rebecca said earlier on a few minutes ago. We can't be so concerned, I would say, with, you know, are they growing academically? Because they're not going to grow if their basic needs are not met. If they're, they just came from a traumatic experience, and that all of that has to be nurtured and, you know, they need to feel safe and they need to have a roof over their head and they need to feel that, you know, they have a consistent home to, to go to and, and, and meals and things of that nature. Recently arrived students are exempt. Again, there is policy that helps support. They're exempt from taking the state assessment, um, particularly the access test, for example. I believe the policy is still at uh, 36 months. Um, or one year, they're, they're not, they don't, if they enter the school at a certain point in time, they have a certain period of time where those accountability kinds of assessments would not be used. And so that's where I would encourage, yes, we need to find out where they are academically, assess in native language as much as possible, instruct in native language as much as possible so that they are on grade level, and then begin the English as a second language language, instruction, and things of that nature. It's going to take time. We're not going to get them to English proficiency in one year, two year, even three years, especially when these are children who, as you know, you read, they traveled on foot for you know, how many countries? Eight countries. They walked through eight countries. Maybe they hopped on the train system and, and different things, but um, those are the things that have to be addressed first. Little by little, we can measure the academics and look for potential um, challenges. I wouldn't be as worried early on about the academics. 
And uh, finally, Dr. Vondelek Navarro, for those out there that say, how the heck are we going to pay for this? Are you saying that there is money available? I think there's funds to tap into, as Carmen mentioned, Title II, especially for teacher training, Title III are for uh, specifically for English learners. But but I would be remiss to say um, I do think schools are going to need more support for wraparound okay. services and support. You know, I don't think it's adequate. I do think there's creative ways to think now. McKinney-Vinto is the homelessness law, and there's funds there that people might not know apply to refugee asylum seekers. They can apply to any student actually experiencing homelessness, and they might not think that newcomers fall under that category, and they can. Um, and I think, too, um, understanding your community and the nonprofits in the area and the supports they can provide are critical, especially for therapy, for other socioeconomic supports. But I do think, um, broadly speaking, Illinois is going to have to think comprehensively about this immigration crisis. I know housing is our first step, of course, uh, but really close by that second step is education for these for these kids. And I, I do want to end on a high note. These kids can and will do well with appropriate supports. Uh, nice. Carmen mentioned our bilingual law works. And, uh, you know, Dr. Ayala and some of my other mentors who are now like in retirement age, this is their <laughs> second time going through a real growth in migrants. And they pushed, they, they were calling University of Chicago. They said, will you look at these kids after they reach English proficiency, please look at how they do. And they did a study of more than 18,000 English learners. And if they're supported in that home language and to build English over time, they do well, they grow. And we're starting to see it in the statewide data too. Mm -hmm. So I know it's, I know it's hard right now and I know we need to work together and I'm not trying to belittle the, the, how difficult and stressful this is. Is, but these kids can and will learn. And, and I really want to end on that kind of asset view of these kids and their families. I mean, you heard that mother talking, that belief in her children and support and the honoring of school and what uh, education can do for their kids should not be minimized. Well, Dr. Rebecca Vonderlack Navarro of Latino Policy Forum and former Illinois State Superintendent Dr. Carmen Ayala. Thank you very much for joining us on Shift Everything for this very important discussion on supporting newcomer students. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Shift Everything. We want to hear your thoughts and bold ideas and share your educational accomplishments. To join the conversation, email us at shifteverything at west40.org.